Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. If you were a kid or a teen in the 90s, there was probably one electronic toy or gadget you just had to have. Something all your friends were talking about. Or maybe you saw it on a commercial during Saturday morning cartoons. Whatever it was, you couldn't live without it. The 90s were an era filled with new and inventive tech toys. Some were groundbreaking, while others, well, they seem a bit laughable now. Like, remember you could print off photos and make them into stickers? Those items hold a very special place in the heart of anyone who grew up in the 90s, because it was a time when things felt super advanced and yet simple at the same time. I'm Kathy Kanzora, and on this episode of History of the 90s, we're going to take a look back at some of the most memorable electronic toys and gadgets of the 90s. So let's dive right in. First up, everyone's favorite virtual pet, the Tamagotchi. The little egg-shaped gadget took the world by storm beginning in 1996. And before the original fad fizzled out, it became one of the most successful toys in history, selling over 80 million units worldwide. In case you're one of the very few people who didn't experience this phenomenon firsthand, let me give you a brief explainer about the toy. The Tamagotchi is a little plastic egg-shaped gadget on a keychain that's equipped with a monochrome LCD screen where you can watch the life of your digital pet. With a few bleeps and bloops, it hatches from an egg, then the pet owner uses three buttons to feed, discipline, and play with the little guy. Take good care of it, and the hatchling evolves into one of seven adult characters. Ignore it, and well, your Tamagotchi wouldn't be so happy. I always remember it. Mine would just scream all of the time, and my parents would get annoyed because at the dinner table, my Tamagotchi in my pocket would just be screaming because there's just poop everywhere over the screen and I haven't cleaned it. That's Brandon Saltalamacchia. He runs a website called Retro Dodo that looks at retro gaming and other products. He says if you didn't look after your Tamagotchi, it could get sick or even worse, die. Which is a bit brutal now that you look at it, but it's a good, I think it was a good life lesson for children to to teach them if you don't look after something, all your hard work will end up disappearing. It may have been a good lesson, but it was also quite stressful for kids and their parents because the only time the Tamagotchi rested was at night. I'll get into that in a minute, but first let's look back at how these little creatures came to life. The idea for the Tamagotchi came from a 30-year-old data entry clerk at the Bandai Toy Company in Japan. Bandai is the same company responsible for the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers craze in 1994 and would eventually merge with Sega. Akameda was watching TV when she thought of a toy pet that kids could look after and take with them everywhere they went. So Maida went to toy designer Akahiro Yokoi, and together they hatched the idea for an egg-shaped handheld pet, which they called Tamagotchi, a mashup of the Japanese words for egg and friend. They also came up with the toy's origin story. Tamagotchi is an alien creature who traveled from its home planet millions of miles in suspended animation to learn about Earth. Meita and Yokoi created a couple hundred prototypes and took them to high school girls in Tokyo and let them play with the world's first digital pet for a few months. Very smart marketing move because teenage girls in Japan in the 90s were the trendsetters. Known for their phenomenal ability to create hits throughout something called kuchikomi, or lightning-fast word of mouth, that spread to their peers, along with siblings and parents. At the time, it was common for marketing firms to use high school girls in Japan to create booms for clients in industries ranging from automotive to cosmetics. They were the original influencers before social media. After a few months of playing with the Tamagotchis and creating a buzz, The high school girls provided some feedback on improvements, and an upgraded Tamagotchi was finally released by Bandai to the Japanese public in November 1996. The toy was an instant success, selling 4 million units in the first four months. 
Which isn't too surprising, considering Japan's love of gadgets had been on the rise since the 1960s. George McNamara, a professor at Georgetown University who specialized in Japanese culture, told the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1997 that the Japanese had grown attached to the consumer electronics industry, which lifted them to a world economic power after World War II. Much like the United States' fascination with the automobile, which generated similar economic success. It wasn't just teens and kids who loved the Tamagotchi. A lot of adults were buying them, too. Professional men were seen nursing their virtual pets while taking the subway to and from work in Japan. A 27-year-old computer programmer told Associated Press in December 96 that he would bring the toy to work and be proud of it because his colleagues didn't have it yet. He also admitted that he might have to stop working and run to the men's room to secretly care for his virtual pet. And a 35-year-old woman told AP that she decided to get a Tamagotchi when she saw so many other women at her office playing with them. At the time, there were already dozens of other keychain video games in Japan. But the Tamagotchi stole the show, igniting a buying frenzy. It was common for hundreds of shoppers to line up for hours outside Tokyo toy stores when a new shipment of Tamagotchis arrived. And soon, the toy was selling on the black market for hundreds of dollars. After taking Japan by storm, the Tamagotchi launched in North America, Britain, and France in May 1997, selling for about $20 US. After months of hype about the virtual pet, kids outside of Japan and their parents were eager to get their hands on one. FAO Schwartz in the United States sold 30,000 units in the first three days. And QVC, the television retailer, sold 6,000 in five minutes. Soon, kids were bringing Tamagotchis to school, and all that beeping and booping became a huge distraction as kids checked on their pets every few minutes. And that led to some schools banning the device. The New York Times wrote this about the situation in 1997. In many Japanese families, the wife, who tends to be a homemaker, looks after the Tamagotchi when her children are at school. In America, where more women work, the keychain chicks might become latchkey chicks, raising the possibility that without constant attention, virtual chicks will turn out to be bad eggs. But seriously, not only could they become bad eggs, they might possibly die. Well, actually, when Bandai launched the toy outside of Japan, they toned down the whole dying thing, saying instead that the Tamagotchi's life cycle ends when it sprouts its wings and returns to its home planet millions of miles away. It can then be reset to hatch a new creature, but the one that has sprouted wings is gone forever. In Japan, the version there was a little harsher. After the Tamagotchi died, the device showed a gravestone and a cross. Kids were so attached to these virtual pets that when they died or went to cyberspace, it could be quite traumatic. For those who didn't want to hit reset and start over, the owner of a pet cemetery in the Cornish countryside of southern England offered them a solution. Terry Squires fenced off a special area of the cemetery where Tamagotchis could be buried. Kids either came in person for the internment, which included a tiny coffin, little square wooden box, or they simply mailed the virtual pet to Squires, who looked after the burial. Squires received Tamagotchis from Switzerland, Germany, France, Canada, and the United States. As soon as Tamagotchi launched in the U.S., there were already knockoffs. Toymakers had been watching the virtual pet craze sweep Japan and got busy making their own versions. Tiger Electronics brought out a line of Giga Pets on the same day as Tamagotchi sales began in the U.S. Priced slightly cheaper at $9.99, Giga Pets initially offered six different pets, which featured real animals like CompuKitty and Digital Doggy. But it later expanded into several licensed characters, including Salem the Cat from the popular TV show starring Melissa Joan Hart, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. According to PC Mag, Giga Pets were very popular in the United States, but they never really held the same mystique as the original Tamagotchi. Nano Pets, made by toy maker Playmates, were also introduced in 1997, 
and initially included a cat called Nano Kitty, a dog and even a human baby that pooped on the tiny LCD screen. Over the next decade, both Bandai and other companies released dozens, if not hundreds, of variations of the pocket virtual pet formula. And though they might not be as common, the Tamagotchi never really went away. In 2013, Bandai recreated Tamagotchi as an app, which more or less replicated the experience of raising a Tamagotchi on a smartphone. In 2017, Bandai created a new Tamagotchi to mark its 20th anniversary, selling for just $15. Then in 2019, a new version for a new generation was released. The Tamagotchi On sells for $60, but has some pretty cool upgrades. First of all, the screen is in color. Second, you can connect to other Tamagotchis, get married, raise kids. But most importantly, you can send your pet to the Tamagotchi Hotel when you need someone to babysit. 30 years later, the makers of the toy understand that it takes a village to raise a virtual pet. I mentioned Tiger Electronics was the company behind Gigapets. Well, the toy company was actually a major player in the 80s and 90s when it comes to toy fads. Tiger Electronics was founded in Vernon Hills, Illinois in 1978 by Roger Schiffman and Randy Rissman, who originally just planned to market record players. But by 1985, they had pivoted to a line of handheld video games. Some people will do anything to take their favorite video games everywhere they go. But now Tiger gives you all the fun and excitement of your favorite arcade game in the palm of your hand. Games like Shino- Tiger handhelds actually predate Nintendo's Game Boy, which I'm going to talk about shortly. But they were pretty basic. They featured just a single game with simplistic controls a monochrome LCD screen, and tinny sound at best. Despite their simplicity, the Tiger handhelds remained popular through the 80s and into the 90s, even after more advanced handheld video games were released. The big reason for the success? The price tag. Tiger handhelds were quite a bit cheaper than Game Boy and its competitors, coming in at just 20 bucks, which made them very appealing. You know, you see it in the store and a kid just can't help but buy it. And in in reality, they have a very short shelf life. You know, a kid will play it for a few days and it gets a little bit boring. So then you want to go and buy the Lion King or Sonic or X-Men one, which I don't know, I can imagine back then was like $20, $30, which you end up buying three or four. You, you could have just bought a Game Boy with a few games back then. The other big reason for their success was the fact that Tiger licensed just about every major property from TV shows and movies to sports stars and popular video game brands. So there were dozens and dozens of Tiger handhelds available to purchase. From Sonic the Hedgehog to Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter to Michael Jordan in Flight and The Lion King. Tiger Electronics, which is now a subsidiary of Hasbro, brought back six of the Tiger handheld games in 2019 which means that for $14.99, you can experience some retro gaming exactly as it was 25 years ago. In addition to handheld video games, Tiger Electronics had a ton of other popular electronic toys, including the Talk Boy, which actually started off as a movie prop. Plaza Hotel Reservations, may I help you? How do you do? This is Peter McAllister. The father. Yes, sir. I'd like a hotel room, please. Yes. With an extra large bed, a TV, and one of those little refrigerators you have to open with a key. Yes, sir. You'll need a major credit card upon checking. Credit card? You got it. You might remember that in the 1992 movie Home Alone 2, Kevin, played by Macaulay Culkin, has a talk boy. It's this small tape recorder that allows him to modify his voice with a simple little push of the speed control button. Kevin is alone in New York after getting separated from his parents at the airport. He uses the talk boy to disguise his voice as his dad's so that he can book himself a room at the Plaza Hotel. Director John Hughes designed the little device himself and then took it to Roger Schiffman at Tiger Electronics and asked him to bring the idea to life. After the movie came out, kids and their parents rushed to toy stores to buy a Talkboy, which was priced at 30 bucks. But there was one problem. It didn't work exactly like the one in the movie. Mainly, there was no voice modulator. It was just a tape recorder. The next year, when Home Alone 2 was distributed on video, 
the problem was fixed. A new Talkboy Deluxe was released, and it worked just like Kevin's. You can have lots of high-tech fun with Tiger's Talkboy tape recorder. It even has speed control. Hi, kids. We're home early. Hi, kids. We're home early. Every videotape of Home Alone 2 came with a brochure advertising the Talkboy Deluxe, and demand went through the roof. So much so that toy stores were totally caught off guard when parents shopping for Christmas gifts bought up all of their stock. And Talkboy Deluxe became one of the best-selling toys of 1993. Tiger Electronics was also behind another fad that left parents scrambling to get their hands on an ultra-creepy talking gremlin. What's that? Me. Oh, it's my Furby. Furby loves you love and touch. Tickle me. Furby, the first giga pet oh, you pet. Go ahead. Pet me. The creators of Furby were actually inspired by the Tamagotchi. In early 1997, David Hampton and Caleb Chung saw the Tamagotchi in action for the first time at the annual Toy Fair trade show in New York. They thought it was pretty cool, but it had one major drawback. You couldn't pet it. So Hampton and Chung began designing an electronic companion you could pet. The working name for the toy was Furball, and it spoke a mishmash of Japanese, Thai, Chinese, and Hebrew, languages Hampton had picked up while serving overseas in the U.S. Navy. They licensed the toy to Tiger Electronics, and the Furball with big eyes and pointy ears hit stores in October 1998. By the end of the year, just a few months later, 1.8 million Furbies had been sold. Parents lined up outside stores for hours to purchase a $30 Furby for Christmas that year. Some parents who didn't get one paid scalpers three times that much to get their hands on a Furby. The following year in 1999, Tiger Electronics sold 14 million Furbies, cementing its place as the must-have toy of the late 90s. Kids either loved it or they were terrified by it. Furbies were huge. They sold millions of units, but now you look at it and it's almost scary to look at. I have one here and I have to put it in, in my wardrobe just to keep it away because if I see it in the middle of the night, I'm not going to be able to sleep all night because they just look so scary now. And you feed them with your finger. They wake up in the middle of, not, of the night still to this day. Somehow the battery's still working from like... 15 years, it's just a really odd product. For the kids that loved it, part of the appeal was Furby's ability to learn English. As I said, it started off speaking a form of gibberish called Furbish, which could be deciphered with the help of a dictionary that came with the toy. But over time, Furby could be trained to start replacing key phrases with English. Furby would also say yum after you fed it by sticking your finger in its mouth, and you could also make it purr by patting its back. I'm sorry, but that's just terrifying. And if that's not scary enough, hackers soon found a way to make Furbies say just about anything. Because the Furby was one of the first widely marketed toy robots, it also appealed to the hacking community, and hacking them became a well-documented hobby. Entire websites depict how to hack a Furby to, among other things, change its voice and its vocabulary. In the early years, there were also some news stories about whether the microphone inside Furby was listening in on private conversations, much like fears today about practically every device in your home. But it was never proven that Furbies were eavesdropping. An updated version of Furby was released in 2005. But by then, the craze had pretty much run its course, and Furby was soon pushed aside for new toy fads like Webkin's. But if you think that was the end of the creepy little guy, it wasn't. Several reboots have been released, including Furby Connect in 2016, which is app compatible. The app, which is called Furby World Connect, lets you hatch and care for furblings and build an entire village for your furry pets. The newest Furby isn't cheap, though, coming in at just over 100 bucks. I mentioned that Tiger Electronics is a subsidiary of Hasbro now. Roger Schiffman and Randy Rissman sold the company in 1998 to Hasbro for $335 million. 
After the acquisition, Tiger Electronics released yet another toy that would become an obsession with kids in the late 90s and early 2000s. Hit it! Coming at you right between the ears is Hit Clips. Music to get you grooving. Hit Clips is a slick micro audio system. This type package is small, but pumps out monster sound. Hit Clips first appeared in McDonald's Happy Meals in 1999. They were called a micro music system and soon became so popular that they were released in toy stores everywhere. Again, if you somehow missed this phenomenon, let me explain. Hit Clips were tiny little memory cards that played 60 seconds of a hit pop song on a little player shaped like a boombox or a CD player. Essentially, it was an early version of digital music which is pretty cool. But like I said, it only played 60 seconds of the song. So if you really like the song, you'd have to go out and buy the CD to hear the whole thing. It was incredibly annoying, but a highly effective marketing tool for record companies promoting acts like Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and Britney Spears. And kids, well, they didn't seem to mind. Best thing about hit clips? Always something new. New players and the newest music, like Michelle Branch. The clips, which sold for about four bucks each, became highly collectible. And the more you had dangling from your backpack, the cooler you were. And what was good about them is that you could, just like Pokemon cards and Game Boy cartridges, that you could trade them with your friends. Let's say you had a song, your friend had a song, you just trade the cartridge at school and you've, you've got yourself a new song. Well, actually 60 seconds of a song, but whatever, close enough. By 2002, Tiger Electronics had sold 20 million hit clips, making $80 million off their latest toy gold mine. Okay, so there were a lot of cool electronic toys in the 90s, but there is one that was more than a fad. It was a revolution. They said it wasn't humanly possible, but now you can have all the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. Nintendo's Game Boy was actually released in 1989, but it ruled the 1990s, and it changed the entire concept of portable gaming, creating a baseline for every handheld console that followed. Game Boy was created by Gunpei Yokoi. The Japanese video game designer previously developed Nintendo's Game & Watch handheld device, which was sold from 1980 to 1991. Like the Tiger handhelds, the Game & Watch featured a single game, but also a watch function. And it also introduced the world to Nintendo's iconic cross-shaped D-pad controller. Legend has it that Yokoi got the idea for Nintendo's first portable gaming system after watching a bored businessman playing on a calculator while he rode the train home from work. After Game & Watch launched, Yokoi continued to work on ways to improve portable gaming. And in 1985, he filed the patent for what would become Game Boy. The patent described it as a handheld electronic game machine for use with detachable memory game packs or cartridges. That was the game changer. Users could play more than one game on a single device, opening up a world of possibilities. I should say that Game Boy wasn't actually the first handheld game with interchangeable cartridges. That was the Microvision, released in 1979 by Milton Bradley. But the Microvision had lots of technical issues and only stayed on the market for a couple of years. The Game Boy launched first in Japan in April 1989 and immediately sold out its initial run of 300,000 units. Three months later, it hit shelves in North America. Initially, Nintendo US planned on including Super Mario Land with every Game Boy, but at the last minute acquired the rights to Tetris, the highly addictive puzzle game that was sweeping the nation. Uh, and what that was good at is not only was it good at getting the kids involved, the parents could, you know, when the kids go to sleep, pick up the Game Boy and play it. And it's a game that every generation, and had, depending on how old you are, you're going to be entertained by it. And it was such an easy game to pick up and play and understand that, uh, you know, it almost made the Game Boy sell as many as it did because, you know, it was such a great game for every generation. Tetris was designed by a 29-year-old Russian software designer, Alexei Pajitnov, in 1984. Initially, the game was secretly shared among Soviet programmers by copying it onto a floppy disk. 
It spread throughout the USSR until a salesman at a Hungary-based software company caught wind of it and asked Pajitnov if he wanted to sell it to countries outside the Eastern Bloc. After jumping through some hoops, they got permission to export the game to the West, where it was initially distributed on PCs. Tetris was an immediate hit, earning ecstatic reviews and selling in healthy quantities. But that was just the beginning. When Tetris was released with Game Boy, it became an absolute sensation, becoming one of the most popular video games of all time, selling 35 million copies on Game Boy alone. Anyone who's played the Falling Blocks puzzle game knows it's super addictive. And apparently when it was first released, people spent so much time in front of screens playing Tetris that they developed a weird side effect. Even after they stopped playing the game, they could still see images of falling pieces when they closed their eyes. Some people even saw Tetris tiles in their dreams. This became known as the Tetris effect. And in recent years, it has come to apply to other games that people play for extended periods of time. Also called gaming-induced pseudo-hallucinations or game transfer phenomena. The original Game Boy wasn't super high-tech. In fact, it contained a dated 8-bit microprocessor with a tiny 2.5-inch monochrome screen, which meant graphics were limited to shades of grey on a dull green background. That's because Yokoi had a very unique design philosophy, which he called lateral thinking with withered technology. It essentially meant using cheap, readily available components in interesting ways. And that was the key to success for Game Boy. Let me explain. Because Game Boy didn't have expensive hardware and battery zapping color displays, It was a truly portable gaming system that you could take with you and use for a long time. In fact, a Game Boy could survive 30 hours of playing on just four AA batteries. And it was relatively cheap, selling for $90. Game Boy's competitors were much more advanced with color displays, but as a result, were more expensive and they burned through batteries. Six batteries lasted only a few hours. Take the Atari Lynx, released just a few months after the Game Boy. It was technically superior in almost every way. It had a backlit color screen and it was based around 16-bit architecture, but at $180, the Lynx cost nearly twice as much as the Game Boy. Sega's Game Gear was released the next year in 1990 and was a bit cheaper than the Atari Lynx at $150, but it was notorious for its short battery life. When Nintendo launched Game Boy in the US, the company had a $20 million marketing plan, which was a lot for a company which was known for being pretty frugal. Typically, Nintendo went after the 9 to 14 age group, but this time they were aiming at 15 to 16 year old boys. They wanted it to be the cool older brother game. 95% of the marketing budget was spent on television ads, like this one. It's portable, it's in stereo, and its games are interchangeable. Plus, Game Boy comes with the outrageous new game, Tetris. And for head-to-head competition, use the revolutionary video link and blow your opponent away. Game Boy. And even though Nintendo's main marketing group were teen boys, they were also interested in girls and adults. In the 90s, technology was seen as a cure for stress instead of the cause of stress. The adult world is designed to keep us moving. And while this may make us more efficient, it's not exactly a party. Luckily, technology has produced a cure. It's called a Game Boy, the personal game-playing system from Nintendo with lots of sports, action, and puzzle games to choose from. And it comes with a puzzle game Tetris. It could change your outlook. Peter Main, Nintendo's vice president for marketing, told the New York Times in 1989, We think that handhelds have broad appeal. The guy out fishing, the businessman on the airplane, the kid on the school bus, we think they'll all like it. Something else that Nintendo pushed about the new Game Boy was its head-to-head connectivity. For the first time, Game Boy's Game Link cable allowed simultaneous multiplayer gaming on a portable system. Don Coiner, head of marketing for Nintendo US, said head-to-head play was this really aspirational thing. Not that many people did it, but everyone imagined doing it. And when they did do it, it was really fun. 
So it was one of those hooks that we sort of grabbed onto as a thing to do. Nintendo produced a million Game Boys for the US in 1989 and sold all of them. Zuma had three years and American sales stood at 9 million units. In 1996, Nintendo introduced the thinner, lighter Game Boy Pocket, which retained the same hardware setup, but unlike the original, it actually did fit in your pocket. Then in late 1998, the Game Boy Color was released, taking Nintendo's handheld device to the next level. The, the great thing about the Game Boy Color is that it was the first Game Boy that came with a colored screen, because originally, if you look back, you probably remember like the old green seaweed, sick looking color of the screen that wasn't very you know, nice to look at, but the Game Boy Color kind of changed the game literally with a colored screen. It also had a bigger screen and a more natural curved case that fit better in players' hands. And because it was backwards compatible with the older Game Boy, players had a huge library of games to choose from. Nintendo also launched a bunch of new games with Game Boy Color, including Pokemon Red and Blue, which kicked off the whole Pokemon craze that continues to this day. Pokemon Red and Blue was actually released in Japan first in 1996 where the tiny pocket monsters quickly became a cultural phenomenon that included a card game, television show, and movie. When Nintendo released Pokemon Red and Blue in North America in September 1998, an animated TV show and card game were unveiled at the same time, unleashing the pocket monster craze in the West. By January 1st, 1999, the Washington Post declared on their annual list of what's in and out that Pokemon is in and Tamagotchis are out. I remember walking up to the shops with my old man and him buying a packet of Pokemon cards for two pounds and there was this shiny Machamp in it and that's when it all started really. That's when it started getting, not troublesome, but you'd go to school and try and talk your friends into trading their, or their rare card for your terrible card. Soon trouble was brewing at schools where kids weren't paying attention in class or were getting into fights while trading cards. And just like Tamagotchis before them, Pokemon cards were soon banned by some school principals. In November 1999, Pokemon, the first movie, opened at the top of the domestic box office. And by the end of 1999, barely more than a year after Pokemon's U.S. debut and just a few years after its Japanese introduction, the Pokemon franchise cracked $7 billion in global lifetime revenues. Thanks in part to Pokemon and Tetris, along with dozens of other popular games like The Legend of Zelda, Kirby's Dream Land, and Super Mario World, the Game Boy and Game Boy Color sold over 118 million units before they were discontinued in 2001 in favor of the Game Boy Advance, which sold another 81 million units. With its various versions of Game Boy, Nintendo helped create and define the portable video game market something it has continued to do with the 3DS and now the uber-popular Nintendo Switch. Compared to the Switch, Game Boy looks like it belongs in a museum as a relic of the past. Actually, an original 1989 Game Boy is in the Smithsonian alongside early cell phones, PDAs, and pagers in a display at the American Enterprise exhibit. You know you're getting old when the stuff you played with as a kid or a teen is now on display at a museum. Or maybe it just means your generation had really cool toys. Thanks for joining me on this look back at some of the greatest electronic toys of the 90s. I'd love to know what your favorite gadget was. You can let me know by reaching out through Twitter at 1990s History and on Instagram and Facebook. Or send an email to 90s at CuriousCast.ca. That's 90s at CuriousCast.ca. And while you're there, let me know what topics you'd like covered on the show. Thanks to Brandon Saltalamacchia for taking the time to talk to me about some of his favorite 90s gadgets and toys. If this topic is something you want more of, make sure you check out his website, RetroDodo.com. I'll put more info about Brandon in the show notes. This episode was hosted and written by me, Kathy Gonzora. Dila Velasquez is our producer, and Rob Johnston is in charge of sound design and final production. See you next time for more History of the 90s. Mm-hmm.